with Frank Song. And uh, the first talk this morning is a survey talk, which will be given by Oriol Guash. And Oriol's uh, talk is entitled Realistic Physics-Based Computational Voice Production. Please. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, well, this, this uh, talk will be mainly an overview of uh, where we're now in computational approaches uh, to generate voice. And I would like, uh, uh, obviously, what I will present you know, is not uh, just one man's work, but it has a contribution of, of many colleagues, and some of, of my colleagues in the department are written here. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, computational, uh, with computational methods, I shall tell you that you can find it them, uh, them everywhere, for instance, in building acoustics, to just compute the structures of, of building and the responses to, to earthquakes. You will find it in the automotive sector, sector to compute the aerodynamics of cars, uh, crashes, bioacoustics, similar in naval applications, and obviously in aerospace uh, planes and, and special launches. So uh, given the, the, the advances in computer science in the past two decades, uh, people have started to wonder if uh, we could use numerical methods to try to, to model how the human body behaves. And there's been a lot of work by, by, by many groups working, for instance, in simulating the heart beating, simulating the, our respiratory system, the biomechanics of, of our skeleton, and some, of, uh, some groups we have uh, devoted our time to try to simulate how the voice organ uh, works. So from a physical point of view, uh, uh, the functioning of, of our voice organ is, is rather complex. And in this very small space of, of 17 uh, centimeters, uh, we have a lot of things going on. And we have the interaction of many different fields. On the one side, we have the biomechanics with the mu muscle activation and posturing. Uh, then we have uh, the interaction of the airflow emanating from the, from the lungs with the, um, the vocal uh, folds that induces the, the cell oscillations and also generates a, a pulsating glottal jet. And this, uh, this uh, both phenomena are a source of sound and this sound uh, propagates in the vocal tract which has a, uh, which has a very complex uh, shape and also moves when we're generating, for instance, uh, lift tongue. And then finally, this sound is, is generated AdWords and uh, other people can, can listen to us. So the point is, uh, can we simulate all these phenomena? And this is uh, what we're gonna talk about it today. So the outline of the presentation, it has two main blocks. The first one deals with uh, resonant phenomena inside the vocal tract. That means we'll talk about vowels, about the generation of vowel-vowel uh, utterances like diphthongs. And we will try to keep this uh, uh, generation of diphthongs with a biomechanical model. Also nasal consonants should be there, but I won't talk about them today. And uh, the second big section deals with our acoustic phenomena, and we will uh, focus on the generation of uh, a civil and S. Uh, we will see which is the standard uh, computational approach for that, and then introduce uh, two simplifying uh, models in order to be able to generate more complex uh, sounds like uh, the sequence ASA. And finally, we will say a few words, words about uh, a fully, uh, fully coupled uh, modelization. And actually, uh, we had uh, quite a lot of, of this in, in Manfred Kaltenbacher uh, key lecture yesterday. So that will be a, a quick thing. So the first uh, thing as regards the generation of vowels is uh, we may wonder which kind of uh, geometry shall we use. For instance, we shall go for very uh, simple geometry, like the one on the left hand of the, um, of the screen, or shall we use a very complex one, like those obtained by the Alta Group in, in Finland? Well, uh, there's a simple answer to that question, and you can make a very simple experiment. You simply take uh, two cylindrical ducts, and the first one on the left, the, the small radius duct and the big one are concentric, while in the other one, um, the, the, the duct with small ra radius is, 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 uh, is not concentric with, with the big one. Now, if you just um, introduce a volume velocity on one end and measure the, the pressure at the exit of the duct, you can get the, the transfer function of the system 
and this is what you get here. And you can check that as long as uh, we don't surpass five kilohertz, what we get is exactly the same response, but if you want to know what happens at higher, frequen uh, at higher frequencies, the response of the two systems are completely different, even with this very uh, simple case. So if you want to understand what's going on at high frequencies in vocal tract acoustics, we shall go for complex geometry. Now, how can we simulate a vowel? That's not very complex. What we have to do is to simply solve the, the acoustic wave equation, and we can, uh, instead of simulating the, uh, the train of glottal pulses, uh, we input that as a boundary condition at the glottis. So we solve the wave equations, uh, inserting a, a, a train of glottal pulses at the, at the glottis and then uh, um, applying or prescribing the other boundary conditions for the remaining of the head. And actually, uh, the situation is not that easy because uh, the problem is that if we make a simulation of that, uh, our computational domain is finite and we want to represent that we uh, are speaking in a kind of anechoic camber. And this uh, obviously makes the equations more complex to do that. To do that. But in this, in this uh, talk, I don't want to talk about complex mathematics, so I will try to escape all that formulas and just keep with the simple ones. So we, just, we are just led with the, with the wave equation, and what we get is this kind of results. We, uh, for instance, we can input a, a Gaussian pulse here and simulate how uh, the wave uh, propagate through the vocal tracts and get emitted outwards. And then if I take the pressure at the, at the outside of the mouth and divide it by the volume velocity, I can get the vocal tract transfer function uh, for that particular uh, vocal tract. And this is, uh, I can plot this kind of function. Here we have the, on the vertical axis the, the vocal tract transfer function, that's the frequency. And the advantage of, of dealing with these finite elements codes is that we can know what's going on inside the vocal tract at a given uh, particular frequency. For instance, if we take the third Foreman, we observe that this corresponds to plane wave propagation and the excitation of a mode in, the, in this cavity. If we have a look at this big dip here, uh, what we observe is that this corresponds to a local resonance between the vellecula and piriform foci. And uh, if we check this, uh, this uh, peak here, we observe that this corresponds to an excitation of a higher order mode, okay? That wave do not propagate up and forwards, but also in other directions. What else can we do is to check, for instance, which are the effects of simplifying the vocal track. Uh, do I really need to uh, use this very detailed MRID uh, uh, data for the vocal track, or can I use this simple one? Well, we can uh, check that. And, and for instance, here we have the, the result of uh, using a complex model towards a simplified one. If I uh, simply uh, remove the, the lateral cavities, what I get is that this big dip here, close to si six uh, kilohertz, disappears. And what I get instead of that is a, a, a three-dimensional excitation of wave propagation in all directions. So going from this one to this one makes a big difference, but going from this one to this one, that makes not such a big difference. Uh, another thing that we can test, for instance, we did that with, uh, with a, a colleague far in, in France at the Gypsy Lab, is to check which are the influence of lips. And here, what we do is to 3D print some mechanical replicas and make the numerical simulations and make a comparison with a model with lips and with a model uh, without lips. And we get this kind of uh, results. Here we have uh, the results with the lips, and, and at the bottom, the results without lips, and for a uh, frequency close to uh, 2,000 uh, um, uh, hertz. So what we observe here is that uh, here we have the results of the numerical simulation, the results of the experiment. And uh, what we, uh, we observe is that the, the numerical simulations closely match the, the experiments, and that the influence of lips at these lower frequencies is very low. So we, ha we have this omnidirectional uh, radiation of sound. But as long as we move to higher uh, frequency, we see that the situation is completely different. If at uh, about 9,000 uh, hertz, I don't use, I remove the lips, 
I get this uh, response, which is uh, highly directional. And I still got very close uh, matching between simulations and, and experiments. But if I remove the lips, I get a completely different uh, result. Okay. Other things that we can check using these uh, numerical approaches is, for instance, if we want to understand the radiation, uh, the effect of radiation losses for, for vowels, one may wonder if we had to simulate uh, um, our problem using a very realistic uh, head or if just a spherical uh, ball uh, would suffice or if a ball with some uh, leaps on it uh, will do the work. So here we have the, res the results for vowel U and vowel A. And what you observe is that if we are only interested in the, uh, in the um, uh, low to mid frequency range, that means up to five kilohertz, it really suffices to use a spherical ball as a good approximation for the head. But if we want to go to uh, higher frequencies, then I should at least include the, the lips which is in accordance with the previous results. So finally, what we can do is we compute the, the acoustic pressure at the exit of the mouth, and then we can convert this into the audio, to, into an audio uh, file and listen to the generated sound. So I'm sorry this didn't work. So these sounds have, have been generated just by solving the acoustic wave equation inside the vocal track. So our next step is to move uh, uh, to diphthongs, to vowel-vowel generation, and in particular, we would like to uh, reproduce the sound I. So what we have to do here is to transition from uh, a vocal track corresponding to an A to the vocal track corresponding to an I. And here we have, uh, we have to move from this spectra with the two characteristic uh, formants of vowel A to that of vowel E. Now, uh, from a computational point of view, this po poses some, some additional problems. If we want to uh, solve a vowel, uh, I, I just say that uh, we only need to, to solve the wave equation, and the wave equation can be derived from, from the Newton seconds law, which is this momentum conservation equation, and the continuity equation. You take row times the first one, uh, the divergence, sorry, of the first one minus um, uh, uh, sorry, row times the time derivative of the first one minus uh, the divergence of the second one, and you get the wave equation. And this is what we need for, uh, for vowels. But the point is that if we want to simulate diphthongs, then the vocal track will move, and we, will, we have to, to express these equations in a system that is moving with the mesh. So this means that our time derivative now have a convective term due to the, um, to the movement of the mesh. And we cannot obtain a, a simple wave equation by, by combining these two, and this leads to what is known in finite elements uh, a mixed problem that it's uh, uh, slightly more difficult to solve than the simple wave equation. But we have to, to solve these two equations to get the acoustic pressure and the acoustic particle velocity. So the type of results that, that we can obtain now of this type, what we get here is a transition from the shape vocal track of an, a, uh, of an A to that of an I. And here we can see a spectrogram. Here we have uh, frequency versus time, and we see how the, the two formals of the A is smoothly transitioned to, to that of an I. And we can uh, listen to the generated sound again. Hey. Hey. Well, it doesn't sound very good here. Okay, maybe this one. And this one is, is exactly the same, but now we are using a more complex and realistic geometry. And here's the, the train of glottis, glottal pulses that is being input at the glottis. And this is the output signal, the evolution from uh, one uh, vowel to the other. And we can listen Aye. to the generated sound. Aye. Okay. Um, What's next? What we've done here to generate this diphthong is to interpolate from one geometry to another, but this is not what we're actually doing when pronouncing the sound I. So uh, our next step was to try to uh, do this transition using a uh, biomechanical model. And this biomechanical model, we used the artisan that was, uh, uh, was constructed in by the uh, University of uh, Columbia in, in Canada. And uh, here we have some dynamic articulators and some static ones. And uh, a fine thing about artisan 
is that if you measure during the pronunciation of, uh, of a diphthongs, uh, the trajectories of some points, for instance, at the tongue, you can input this into the, into the cone, and it will give you uh, an, approximate, an approximate solution of how muscles get activated in order to reconstruct that sound. So this is what, what, what you get. So an, our next step here would be to, okay, we need a closed cavity in order to solve for the, for the foreman, uh, sorry, for the diphthong sound. So this is what uh, we, we did with uh, some colleagues at KTH. We use uh, what's called a growing circle method and for each section we get a closed surface that then we can uh, put everything together and, and simulate a more realistic way, in a more realistic way, the generation of, of a diphthong. And here's the, the simulation. That's artisan, that's the extracted closed geometry, and then we can generate the sound. Aye. Okay, and now this, it's not just simple interpolation, but it comes from muscle activation. And here's another one. Aye. More, more complex one. So that's what I wanted to explain as, as regards uh, uh, the generation of, of sounds that are driven by resonances in the vocal tract, and we shall now move to uh, to our acoustics and the simulation of sounds like S. Okay, now uh, to generate uh, an S, what we do is, is, is in, in, in a few words, we just uh, move uh, uh, the anterior portion of, of the tongue up to the heart palate, and this accelerates the, the glottal pulse very much, and then this uh, jet, uh, sorry, the glottal jet, and then this jet passes through the gap between incisors, and uh, when it leaves this small gap between incisors, it generates a lot of, uh, of, of edices. And these edices uh, uh, of vortices are sound of our acoustic uh, source. They also impact the lower lips, which also results in the, in the production of, of sound, which gets diffracted by the teeth. Okay? And this our acoustic phenomena is what results in, in the generation of a sound like this. So uh, if you want to simulate this, uh, we have a, uh, an, an, an additional big problem, and it's that we need to know which is the uh, source of sound that the movement of the, of the fluid is, is, uh, is making. So there are very different uh, ways to tackle with that problem. The most simple one is the light field acoustic analogy, and I will talk about this one uh, for for the ease of illustration, but we could also use the acoustic perturbation equations, the linearized Euler equations, some unified isentropic solver for uh, the fluid dynamics and acoustics, or just uh, go for the full compressible CFD simulation and then try to extract the acoustics from there. So in the light fields uh, analogy, which uh, it's, it's just a reordering of the, of the compressible uh, Navier-Stokes equations, uh, uh, the good thing about it is that for low Mach numbers, we can approximate this tensor by means of what is called the, the Reynolds tensor, which is the product of the different components of the velocity. So uh, what we have here is just a wave equation with uh, an acoustic source term that we have to uh, compute. And this uh, source terms involves a double divergence, which means that represents a quadrupole. Okay, if we have just single a divergence that's a dipole, you will have a time derivative of the source term that will correspond to a monopole. So the problem is that we have to obtain this by solving, uh, uh, we can obtain this, sol sorry, by solving the nonlinear uh, Navier-Stokes equations. And this, the problem is that this is uh, really, really costly. And I will provide you just some examples, for instance, uh, to generate an, a an, uh, an S up to uh, 2,000 um, uh, hertz, uh, we need to make a simulation on a supercomputer facility uh, using uh, 46 million elements. That, that's, a, that's a big simulation. And uh, then you get this, this type of results, for instance, that, uh, that, that's a cut in, in, in this way, and what you get is uh, this, uh, you have here the, the constriction and the flow, and you, you, have, you, you see how this is strongly uh, turbulent, and from here we can obtain the, the source term, that is what, what we had here, that it's what produces acoustic waves in this case, and then we can uh, compute 
the, the generated sound. Okay, these are some tr transient signals, but you see that uh, these are the acoustic waves corresponding to the generation of an S. And what we get is this uh, black uh, curve here uh, that it's, uh, we have compared with measurements of several S sounds in literature, and we can see that we can reproduce the main trends of, of that sound. But as I told you, the problem is that uh, this is very costly and we can only uh, uh, simulate a very few milliseconds of that sound and this is not enough to generate uh, an audio file. So what we try to do is to uh, use different uh, approaches in order to solve that problem. And the first one is to say, okay, we want to skip the computation of the nonlinear Navier-Stokes equations because this is very time consuming and we want to find a means to approximate this uh, source term. So uh, one of the, of the options that, that we have uh, recently uh, tested is uh, to use, uh, instead of using uh, this tensor, what we will do is to use an analytical model for a turbulent eddy that it's spinning. And in particular, we use uh, the, uh, a model for what I call hits of vortices, and a kitsch of vortices is something like, like this. It's a two-dimensional rotating uh, quadrupole, okay? That's a, a kind of elliptical, elliptical eddy that generates this uh, quadrupolar sound that, uh, that it's spinning. And what we do is that we randomly set uh, um, many, many of these vortices in the source region where the S is generated, okay? And we can do this very, very fastly. So here we have uh, a comparison about the hybrid computational or acoustic, the standard approach, and the one we use with these uh, kits of vortices. Now here you have a comparison between experimental uh, data for the S, uh, the standard CAA approach, and the kits of vortices, and we see that the matching is quite reasonable. And if you look that in terms of computational cost, what we see is that we need 40, about uh, I told 46 million elements for the CIA, and we only need uh, 800,000 elements for the kits of vortices. We need 256 processors at the sub supercomputer center in order to, to get that result, and we can do this uh, now in a lab computer with just four processors. And um, if you, uh, you see which is the computational cost, in one case it would be about 2,000 uh, I'm sorry, about 12,000 uh, computational hours in front of 10, 21. Okay, in real time, that would be two days. That would be five hours in a supercomputer center in your laptop computer. If you have access to a 16 processors computer, which is not that difficult, then you can reduce this by a factor of four. Okay, and another thing is, um, that's fine, we can generate this S sound, but we would also like to uh, uh, compute more uh, complex uh, sound sequences like CASA. Uh, so how can we do that? We could use that uh, uh, kits of approach, but in, but in order to test it, we decided to go uh, first for for simplest option that we uh, uh, basically grasp it from, from one-dimensional approaches. So here we have to now transition from a geometry of an A to that of an S and, and then again to, to that of an A. So it means we have to generate vowels, we have to generate sibilants and in the, at the right time, I would say. So uh, we use a very simplified now our acoustic source model that instead of consisting of a distribution of quadrupoles, it will consist of a single monopole and a single dipole. Okay. And, and here we will use now, because this it's, uh, we are at the very beginning of this kind of, 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 the, of, uh, of simulations, we have used these simple uh, vocal trot shapes. That's an A, an S with a very strong constriction, and an A again. So what we have to do now? We have this, uh, we will simply solve the wave equation, which means that given that the, our, our vocal track is moving, we have these additional terms, so we have to solve the mixed problem. But now, uh, for the vowels, we simply need to input here a boundary condition, but in order to activate the, the, the our acoustic source, we have to input here some sound sources. 
Okay, and we do that by inserting a monopole, which corresponds to inserting a source term in the uh, continuity equation, and, uh, and a dipole, which corresponds to inserting a force in the momentum conservation equation. So what we do is we insert the monopole at the, at the exit of the constriction, and we input a dipole here representing the diffraction by the teeth. And in both cases, uh, we use the, the amplitude using uh, Gaussian white noise. So that's pretty much what, what one, uh, the strategies that one follows in 1D, but translated to this uh, finite element context. So we next uh, uh, activate the, the simulation, and here we see how uh, we start from a neutral uh, geometry, we go to that of an A, then we move to that of an S, then we move again to that of an A. Now we activate the glottal pulses when we have the day going on, and there is here an, um, a certain overlap because we don't want the sounds of the vowel and the S to be uh, disconnected. So we have this activation of the glottal poles even when we almost in the uh, shape of an S. So we can uh, simulate this, this effect, and this is what, what we get here. That's the chain of glottal pulses. Now we first have an A, and this is the, the, out, the pressure output for an A. Now, when we reach the shape of an S, we activate the monopole and the dipole, and then the output changes to that of a, an, an aerodynamic sound, and then we move again to a vowel, and we get, we recover the sound of, of an A, okay? <laughs> and uh, we can listen to, I'm sorry, I just want, okay. And here is what we have, we have the spectrogram, that are the, those are the, um, the formants of the A, and then, uh, as you observe, in the A, the sound pressure is mainly driven by the formants, while when we have the S, the, the, the pressure is mainly at, at the high frequency rate. So here we have some spots, and we can listen to the generated sound. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, that's what we've got for the moment. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I just wanted to skip that. Okay, and finally, before uh, finishing, a few words on fully coupled simulations. As I told you, uh, uh, Manfred in the in, in yesterday keynotes uh, uh, talk uh, uh, at extent of this kind of simulations. Actually, he was one of the first uh, to start with that, using two-dimensional uh, models back to 2009, and then he has done uh, some more recent simulations uh, using this trick of prescribing the the movement of the vocal folds. Uh, we attempted that also at fully uh, coupled simulation without this prescription, but using very simple model, a single layer models for the for the vocal folds. And finally, the, the, there's this very uh, nice work by, by uh, Jiang Cheng and Chue from Maine University, in which uh, they, they even are able to, to recover the coupling between the, the acoustics and, and the mechanics of, of the vocal folds. So that's a very uh, uh, heavy problem because, uh, I mean, you don't need to, to, to look at the equations, but the point is that you need to simulate the fluid structure interaction to get the self-oscillation of the vocal folds. Uh, you need a contact model for the vocal folds, and then you need an, acoust an acoustic model for the generated waves. And you have to solve everything together. And this is an animation done by our colleagues at KTH in, in, in a joint work in that, uh, shows how the glottal pulse is generated. Okay, that's a cut of, the, of a simplified model for the vocal folds. And this is uh, how it's generated. And then we also attempted at a, a unified simulation uh, with the vocal tract to generate sound I, and where we have the velocity and the acoustic pressure. But uh, the fact is that if you, if you try to, if you look at the output of that kind of simulations, what you get is a, a quite nosy signal. I mean, we recover in the envelope the, the formants of the vowel, but if you listen to that, it doesn't sound very good. Now, our guess is that our contact model in this case was not uh, pretty good, and there are a few things to solve there. So this uh, brings me to the conclusions, and I would like to say that, uh, well, uh, a huge amount of work has been done in the, in the past decades as regards the, the, the numerical simulation of voice. 
uh, that we have many, many pieces of the puzzle there, but I, I believe we still are a little bit far from, from being able to, to reproduce a full uh, couplet simulation of a distant, of a distant or syllable, let's say. And uh, we still need to generate more complex sounds, uh, like uh, uh, sounds in including uh, plosives and, and other, ta other, other consonants uh, apart from sibilants. And, um, and the nice thing about the topic is that obviously if you want to go to, to solve these kind of problems in this way, you need the collaboration of, of people from many uh, different scientific uh, uh, disciplines, uh, which uh, make it very uh, enriching. And, um, and many, many uh, obviously challenges remain. For instance, one of them is trying to include expressivity in the numerical generation of voice. And we have done some first steps uh, uh, towards this goal, but we are just at the very first uh, beginning. And my colleague will give a talk on that in the work uh, subsynthesis uh, uh, this weekend in Vienna. And um, I would say that, okay, this is, a, a, from my opinion, a quite a fascinating and, and, and appealing uh, topic, both from a mathematical and physical point of view. But uh, we should took, uh, care about how to validate the results because just producing uh, the sound that you want to produce, it's not a, a direct validation that you have done everything correct. And I always like to finish this kind of presentation saying that uh, uh, those researchers that come from uh, the numerical uh, framework, we are used to visualize uh, our results while people working on, on speech are used to listen to their results and with this kind of approaches, you can uh, do both. You can see how waves propagate and you can see how they sound. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks, Oriol. And now we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you very much. That was a very nice talk. Um, I was thinking that some of these phenomena that you that you've observed, where there's a mismatch mismatch between the those observed spectral characteristics and the, and the simulated characteristics are often in frequencies that really don't matter very much in terms of auditory perception, that our perceptions of performance at six to seven, hertz, seven kilohertz, for example, is extremely poor. Mm. Is there a way in which by thinking about the limitations of auditory perception, you could work out which aspects of the simulation are necessary and which aspects of the simulation could be simplified? Yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. I mean, uh, first I would like to say that it's true that uh, mainly how our, um, I mean, uh, what, what the word? I mean, in order to identify the given sound, it would suffice to go up to five kilohertz and everything runs uh, right there. But it's, it is true that some authors, for instance, Monson says that in order for voice to be more natural, you need some contents at high frequencies. So this is one thing. Another thing is that uh, uh, you are totally right, and this is the, the same type of thing that happens, for instance, in mechanics. If you want to simulate the vibroacoustics of a car, you need to know in which detail you have to do these simulations. Must I put all the screws there and all the fine tuning, or it suffices uh, to get a, a rope model? So we, we are still there in, in trying to know in which degree of detail we have to, to run the simulations. Okay, question there. Thank you for the talk. Uh, similar question, but when you uh, simulate the S, could you please use the microphone? We don't hear. Uh, when you simulate the S uh, with uh, Kirchhoff vortex uh, source, uh, peak was a bit different from the yes. flow simulation. What is happening in that oh. source? Many things could happen there. I mean, uh, obviously, if we use this uh, kits of vortices, this is a, a very simplified model. So what we tried to do uh, when we simulate that was to adjust the kinetic uh, uh, energy of, of, the, of the flow. So we make this CFD computation. We get the, the, the spectra that is first at low frequencies driven by, by the largest vortices. 
and then it decays following the Kolmogorov uh, spectrum. So what we try is to adjust the vortices in order to recover that, that shape. And, uh, but, uh, and, and I haven't shown here, but uh, obviously we have to make many re realizations and in the mean, you get a similar result to that of the, of, of, of the CFA, uh, CAA simulation. But obviously this is a simple model and for instance, uh, uh, we can uh, simulate how a vortex generates sound and this is affected by the TIF, but we cannot simu simulate the effect of the sound direct directly generated by uh, vortices impining on, on the lower lip. So, the, the, I mean, there's a price to pay uh, for this low computational effort that we cannot get exactly the same, the same result, yeah. Okay, Albert. Thank you. Thank you Mar very much for a nice uh, talk. Uh, you. Is your main goal to try to produce speech that is similar and natural as human speech or do you really try to mimic the whole process? And if the latter is the case, maybe you could, did you consider, I once did experiments with pressure transducers to measure pressure below and above the vocal folds. So then yes. you know what pressure fluctuations are going on within the vocal tract. Yeah. Maybe you could use that then for validation. Yes, uh, um, we actually uh, were focusing, I mean, I mean the, what you say is true, and, and there are several groups that uh, uh, mainly focus on, on phonation, and they do this kind of simulations, and actually, for instance, for, for, the, for the complex simulation, we have to consider some, some uh, subglottal uh, uh, geometry for, for the vocal track. But in, in our case, in most simulations here, our final goal was in uh, to generate the sound from and 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 focus on vocal uh, on the vocal tract acoustics. So we we use uh, the train of pl uh, glottal pulses like like a boundary condition. So uh, let's say that we are interested in getting the the physics of what's going on there and see how this can give place to to a given sound. And we are some somehow I mean uh, um, addressing the problem by parts and then trying to put everything together. Make it a one very quick question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, given the fact that uh, you know, getting uh, real human sound using this physics-based model is very hard, and- um, okay, Could you repeat somebody? Given the fact that uh, using this physics-based model, getting yes. uh, real human sound is very hard, and on the top of that, uh, getting that in real time or adding expression is super tough. Uh, so uh, have you considered any kind of clinical research-based problem where you can address using these models? Yes, actually this is the, the, the I would say, the mid-term objective. I mean, it's the same people in Foundation, they want to, to, to very clearly uh, simulate and very re realistically simulate the self-oscillation of the vocal tract of the vocal folds, uh, sorry, uh, to see how uh, uh, they would behave in, 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 in case of a medical problem. And it turns out that, that the same kind of problems could appear also in the, in the vocal sac. Uh, for instance, when generating a diphthong, there are people that having some inflammation or problems with the tongues and do not follow the, the standard path, so we could check how uh, the voice can change due, due to, to these effects. But for the moment, we're just focusing on trying to understand and simulate the, the whole physical process. Okay, there's one final part of this survey talk, and I'll leave this to Thomas Kahn. Well, thank you very much again to Toriel and this wonderful talk. And as a token of thank, uh, thanks from the speech uh, organizing oh. committee, uh, sort of a, a reminder of your wonderful talk. Thank wow. you very much. That's very kind of you. <laughs> thank you, you very thank much. You. Thanks a lot. Didn't expect that. Great. <laughs>